now time for the Mike Wagner Show. Powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. The Mike Wagner Show brings you famous celebrities and amazing people from all over the world. Listen online at themikewagnershow.com and on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And watch the interview on YouTube. So sit back and relax and enjoy the Mike Wagner Show. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the themikewagnershow.com. Also, check our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Also on Radio Public, Anchor FM, and also the YouTube channel. You subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show and take the Mike Wagner Show with you on a mobile device. We're here with a wonderful lady who is the interstellar woman of mystery. She's the author of over 40 books, including the latest book of the shuttle disaster, co-author of the Crisperian Saga series and critically acclaimed Displaced Detective series. She's worked over 20 years in space programs with various degrees in astronomy, physics, chemistry, mathematics, geology, anatomy. Also licensed in ministry, duly sworn certified police officer and National Weather Service storm spotter, which we can use these days in terms of changing weather. And um, here he is, just a fascinating lady from down in the deep heart of Alabama, the interstellar woman of mystery, Ladies and gentlemen, the fascinating Stephanie Osborne. Stephanie, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, well, you're welcome. You're the author of 40 books, including the latest about the shuttle disaster. You co-authored the Chris Berry and Saga series and critically acclaimed Displaced Detective series. And you also um, have also done a number of things like Climb Pikes Peak. You went across bridges, went down gold mines. And um, you also have a book that's coming out called Burnout, the Mystery of Space Shuttle STS-281, and you also had some uh, other books, and you also been with a National Geographic and um, quite a few others. But before we get into all that, tell us how you got started. I beg your pardon? Tell us how you got started in your career. Oh, geez. Um, well, my writing career is, is a relatively recent thing. I only started it, uh, well, I've always I've always written. I've never been a professional author until about... Eleven years ago was when I first got my um, got my first uh, book contract. I actually started off as a kid wanting to work in a space program, so I spent like a couple of decades working in the civilian and military space industries. Uh, worked with uh, the space shuttle, the the International Space Station. Uh, helped train astronauts, sat console for missions. You know that whole thing. And then I lost a friend on board uh, the Shuttle Columbia disaster. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of, I don't know, after that, a lot of the fun went out of it for me. Mm. And I started thinking, maybe I need to get out of this and go do something else. Mm -hmm. And And that's when the, the whole writing thing came to be. Burnout, you mentioned it a couple of times. That was my first novel. And I had actually started working on it before the Columbia disaster. And they say, write what you know. So I did. I wrote about a shuttle disaster. And I actually had completed the first draft, put it in the hands of my writing mentor to help me to read it and help me polish it. Mm. And when the Columbia went down, he had just finished it. And I had pretty much nailed the scenario. The only wow. difference being my fictional scenario was sabotage, and the real life scenario was was accidental. And so um, he was like, "Steph, this is good," and I was like, "I'm going to trash it." He's like, "No, you're not." He just just because I, I was freaking, uh, I was so upset, and he said, "No, it's good. Don't trash it. Let's polish it. I can help you find a publisher. Let's let's do this." And that's and he did help me find a publisher, and so that's how it all got started. Now, did you have to change the ending to to the actually what happened as accidental instead of the um the uh, what was it uh, 
the sabotage in that book? Yeah, I, I did. I, I went ahead and went with the sabotage concept in the book um, because I, I wanted to make it clear. I, I you, you can't imagine. I, I nailed everything from the orbital inclination to the overflown states. I mean, it was just, um, I, I was seriously freaking out. But he said he pointed out you worked in the industry for all these many years. You know how this works. You just happened to pick a mission payload that was similar to the one that was up on Columbia. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, it all tends to follow the same patterns. And and so I decided to to make it very very plain that what I was writing was not the real life story of what really happened but was an actual you know fictional concept but i did dedicate the book to my friend and to the rest of the crew of the columbia oh okay so now let's refresh everyone's memory about the uh, space shuttle columbia what happened and um you know the events leading up to it so maybe just a little bit of a refresher well what what happened was that um that that's the one that burned up during reentry. That broke apart and burned up during reentry. Um, what happened was that during launch, a piece of the insulating foam on the external tank broke loose, and it impacted. Um, uh, at this point in time, I can no longer remember which wing it was. I want to think it was the port wing, but I may be wrong on that. But it impacted the wing from the leading edge punched a hole through the leading edge of the wing and gouged a groove all the way down the bottom of the wing. And that wound up, um, during re-entry, you had atmospheric blow-through into the interior of the wing, which started to basically soften all of the struts, the structural support of the wing it also uh, managed to blow through into the interior because of the gouge, blew through into the wheel well mm -hmm. for the landing gear. And the the tires, they're gigantic tires, uh, but they the, the heating was so tremendous. And near as anybody can figure from what I understood uh, reading the, the various and sundry after, after investigation reports, apparently... There was a combination of the structural support for the wing, which was all metal, had softened. At least one of the tires blew, and the combination of those two things basically caused the wing to rip off. Wow. So, yeah. So as soon as the wing is gone, you've lost all aerodynamic stability. The craft went into a tumble and broke up. Hmm. At, it, like, at like Mach 17. Amazing! Wow, it's like I could not imagine it when I when I hear about the space shuttle Columbia. Also, maybe think of the space shuttle Challenger when it went up in the air and it blew up. And I have to share my story on this one too because I was working as a shift reporter for WSIU in Carbondale, Illinois, back in 1986 when I heard the teletype just going crazy, you know, ding, 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 ding. And for those who don't know, what teletypes were that it was just a news wire that was giving like the um, latest up to date. When it goes ding, 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 that means uh a breaking news, news alert, urgent, whatever it is. And I heard this ding and I read it says that space shuttle Challenger has exploded in space. No known casualties. And I read out loud and it says, guys, you better take a look. And they all said, holy crap. And there was like maybe 20, 30 people that barged in the newsroom. And I just snuck out of there avoiding getting trampled. And I, and I read something about this, too, and I thought similar. It's like, well, it seems like the, to me the Challenger and Columbia were both like the same thing. And it was like, you know, you know, someone designed that just kind of blew up. It's just scary. Well, you know, they were both due to uh, the same thing. They were both due to uh, temperatures at the pad, on the launch pad, getting down too cool the night before the launch. Mm -hmm. um, one, one caused uh, ice to crystallize in, you know, the, the external tank was so big when you, the foam was a, was a, one of those two components spray on jobs, but you, you had to do it in batches because the, the tank was so big. And so in, in the, the, 
disconformity between batches was where the the ice crystals formed and evidently pried loose a chunk of of the foam about the size of a briefcase. Mm -hmm. And that's what caused Columbia. Challenger had a similar thing happen. The temperatures got down too low, but what happened there was that the O-rings in between the segments for the for the solid rocket boosters uh, hardened in the cold and lost their flexibility, lost their ability to seal off uh, between the segments of, of the booster, which were also so big that they had to be done in segments, and so they were stacked. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was, a, you know, the cause was similar, and and they wound up. Uh, there's a hard and fast rule now. If the temperature is below a certain a certain temperature, they won't launch. Mm. Even the next day, they won't launch. That, so, uh, you know, they they kind of learned their lesson. That is amazing too, and uh, we'll talk more about that as well too, along with the. Uh, Book and some others. You listen to the Mike Wagner Show at the MikeWagnerShow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios.com for all your needs. Looking professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1 800 303 3960. That's 1 800 303 3960. Or email to support at SonicWebStudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to the next level. Also, The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the themikewagnershow.com. You can also check our Facebook page, facebook.com slash The Mike Wagner Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Also, watch the interview on YouTube as well, too, on The Mike Wagner Show. And also, listen on Radio Public and Anchor FM. You can also take The Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with Stephanie Osborne, the interstellar woman of mystery, veteran of more than 20 years in the civilian space program, as well as various military space defense programs, worked on numerous space shuttle flights in the International Space Station, counts the training of astronauts on her resume as well, too. Space experience includes Space Lab, ISS operations, and many, many more. She's also author of over 40 books, including the latest about the shuttle disaster, and also co-authored um, a couple of series as well, too, the Crisperian Saga series and the critically acclaimed Displaced Detective series. And, um, you know, getting back to uh, the uh, the book, Burnout, the Mystery of the Space Shuttle, STS-281, and uh, is there any talks about uh, having that uh, going to um, movies or film or anything like that? Well, at one point in time, um, it was actually optioned as a feature film, uh, but the, the option lapsed. What wound up happening was that was about the time that the country's credit rating got lowered mm-hmm. and all of the, um, the would-be uh, financial backers got cold feet. So, um, yeah, I would love to see it go to feature film, uh, but so far, uh, no. (laughs) (laughs) And, and, and of course, you know, you just um, also been uncredited science consultant for National Geographic's um, Rocket Sea Rednecks, and I just saw that. Maybe just uh, tell us a little bit about that. (laughs) That looks pretty fun. Rocket City Rednecks. (laughs) Yes. Well, uh, have you had, did you see the show? Uh, Some years back. Oh, my gosh. It's like, you know, I have to say this. I don't have cable. That's the thing. But now you look at it, it's like, oh, I wish I was seen this now that you mentioned it. <laughs> well, um, it, it, so it, 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 uh, it starred Dr. Travis Taylor. Um, he happens to be a friend of mine. He also is my writing mentor. He's the guy that talked me out of trashing the burnout manuscript Mm -hmm. um and and he was the star of the show the concept was let's show let's let's use you know garage uh, mechanic uh techniques to show people how this stuff really works and you know to to teach people and to show them what kind of science you can do in your backyard kind of a thing Mm -hmm. and and like i said travis is a friend of mine so occasionally he would call me up, Steph, had an idea for the show. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to do this, and we'd wind up brainstorming. And I was, uh, it was supposed to be a closed set, but I was one of the, the people who was allowed on set, you know, in, in the in the background. And I would I would help out. I would, you know, help help set 
materials up or whatever. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I, and I, I didn't get any credit for it, and that's cool. That's that's all right. I got to see what it was like, you know, doing a show like that, which was kind of interesting. And um, so it, it's it was it was kind of a fun little thing, and uh, they they filmed. He did his day job during the week, and then they filmed on the weekends. So each weekend was at least one episode. So mm. That that kind of gives you. I think it was about a half hour show. So, but they would they would have all kinds of projects, everything from constructing a submarine to building a, a fairly good sized rocket mm-hmm. uh, to to can we can we come up with ideas to protect a um, a, a vehicle from an um, IED mm-hmm. and, 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 and uh, basically an uh, a landmine, basically, mm-hmm. and so but they were usually pretty successful. Occasionally, it would go, you know, in an odd direction that they weren't expecting. But um, yeah, it was it was kind of an interesting, fun show. It, it sounds amazing too. I have to uh, check that out. And uh, you also got involved in a series uh, back in January 2017, Division One, with the first book, Alpha and Omega. And uh, you can just uh, tell us a little bit about that one. Well, that's that's um, that's an ongoing series. Um, I'm actually working at. Let's see, what is it? It's book twelve. Uh, yeah, I think I think I'm working on book twelve now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's my take on the urban legend of those guys in the dark suits who show up at the UFO encounters and make the evidence go away. It, it sounds like Men in Black. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, that yeah that. It's it's uh, the movies use the same uh, urban legend material that I'm mining for for my stories. Um, so, but I go off in a completely different direction from what from what they do with it. Um, but yeah, that's that's the, that's the urban legend. Um, I, I use all of it, Men in Black, UFOs. Um, I, it it's kind of funny because. Um, the the show on the history cha- well you don't get cable there's a show on the history channel uh that that's all about you know it's all of the the what i call the true believers you know the ones that okay we've been visited by by aliens for lo these many centuries and they're really living among us and all this kind of stuff and it's it's funny because when i can actually stand to to watch the show without wanting to throw a brick at my tv <laughs> I get all kinds of cool ideas for the stories. So, um, and and I just I just take the urban legends and I and basically I turn them on their ear. Mm-hmm. So, but I also tell people, you know, I write this series with my tongue planted so deeply in my cheek that's poking outside of my face. Oh my gosh! So, so, so I write them with humor. You know, the the characters, uh, people, people think. You know, they're like, who did you base this? It's a real person, isn't it? No, uh, it's not. <laughs> um, but the characters are realistic to my readers. And so, you know, they they poke fun at each other. They they have running gags, running jokes. But occasionally things get really, really, really very serious, too, because they can get hurt. Mm-hmm. They can be killed. Um, you know, they, they it's, it is not... Uh, an, not not every alien out there is inferior to humans in abilities or strengths or anything like that, you know. And sometimes they have to deal with that, and they have to figure out, okay, as a human, I don't have this ability. How do I counter it? Mm-hmm. And and so basically, they are they are part of the galactic police force. Is the way I play it. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. So there, there is a the the Pan Galactic Coalition is the galactic government, mm-hmm. and then they have the galaxy divided up into what you or I would consider precincts, mm-hmm. are called divisions. Mm-hmm. Earth is in Division One, hence the name of the series. Got it. Okay. And what are your thoughts on the C- the TV series Star Trek? Beg your pardon. What are your thoughts on the TV series Star Trek? Geez, um, I grew up on Star Trek. <laughs> um, I, I was um, I was a kid when Star Trek first aired, mm-hmm. and Star Trek 
and the Apollo 1 fire were together responsible for my winding up working in the space program. Mm-hmm. Because, the, you know, one happened while the other was airing, basically. And so I looked at it, and I said, looked at the TV show, and I said, that's where we could wind up being. Uh-huh. And then I looked at the disaster, and I said, this is where we are. These guys thought it was important enough to risk their lives to get there. And, you know, little kid, I'm like elementary school, and I'm like, I want to help get from here to there. Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and from then on, you know, my big, my big push throughout all of my education was I'm going to work in the space program one of these days. That sounds amazing too. And of course, you know, how you got inspired, you know, you know, like with, uh, you know, Star Trek and just about everything else. And, um, you know, we mentioned about Space Lab, ISS operations, and you also experienced with variable star astrophysics, Martian alien and geophysics, I hope I got that right, radiation <laughs> physics, nuclear, biological, and chemical weapon effects, and maybe just in a nutshell, just um, tell us about those, and maybe just um, how you got interested, especially with um, variables, variable star astrophysics and Martian alien geophysics, that's A-E-O-L-I-N geophysics. That's It's pronounced aeolian, and basically it, that is having to do with the wind. Okay. So basically, uh, aeolian geophysics has to do uh, with wind-borne particles. Mm-hmm. Think how sand dunes form. Think how dust storms form. That kind of thing. Um, I wound up uh, writing a paper about that, and I wound up. I, I did a whole lot of studies on it, and I came to the conclusion that because of the very, very lower air pressure on Mars relative to Earth that the same type of particles on Earth, geophysicists divide particles, they size particles according to the way they behave, everywhere from dust specks up to boulders. So a pebble is defined as a certain size, a sand grain is defined as a certain size, a silt grain is defined as a certain size, a dust grain is defined as a certain size, going going smaller. Mm-hmm. What I found was that um, we're going to have to redefine those because they define the sizes based on their behaviors on Earth, but they don't behave like that on Mars because the air is much thinner. Mm-hmm. And so if you want a sand grain on Mars, it's going to be much smaller than it would be on Earth because the air can't carry it and form a sand dune, Mm -hmm. you know, at the same size as it would be on Earth. So that was that was kind of what that paper was about. It was, you know, here's here's the behavior. Here's how the definition is going to have to change, because here's the size of the particles that do the same thing on Mars as this size of particle would do on Earth, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, my my graduate work was in variable star astronomy. Um, and basically, there's, there's stars out there, there are many, many stars out there that do not maintain a constant brightness for various reasons. Uh, some of them actually pulse in size. Uh, some of them are not spherical. They're, they're oblong. So... You know, when when the end of the thing is facing you, it seems dimmer than when the side of it is facing you. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them have spots like the sun. Um, and if you get a big enough patches of spots, then as the spot circles around, the, the light from the star appears to dim. Uh, and so th- this, this was, um, you know, this is what I studied in graduate school. And I do actually maintain a certain level of, of, of interest in that, a certain level of activity in that, even though I'm, I'm now retired and writing books. Mm-hmm. Um, because many variable star astronomers consider the sun that is at least borderline variable because of, its, uh, because of the solar cycle, the sunspot cycle. Mm-hmm. And so I keep, keep track of, of 
sunspots and stuff like that. And and I'm I'm looking at it's it's uh, certain researchers uh, are of the opinion we might be be about to go into an extended minimum, you know, where where the sunspots bottom out and don't show up, and some things like that. And I and I've been following this for quite some years now. I've I've got a running spreadsheet that I've kept for the last three years of sunspot data. Uh, just you know, looking at looking at the variability and and how it's changing with time and how each cycle is changing as as each sunspot cycle progresses. Mm-hmm. So you know, those are the sorts of things that that I that I do in my spare time these days. <laughs> Amazing okay. too. And I was going to ask you one more question before we um get to the books as well too. That um you know some people are saying the sun keeps getting hotter and hotter and the temperatures keep getting hotter and hotter as well too. And of course, you know, I guess just wanted to say it's like, you know, I, I'm going to throw this out there. Do you, would, would that be tied to global warming? <laughs> I want to throw that out there. Well, um, the 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 sun's, um, you know, the sun is 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 the big is the big engine at the center of the solar system. So, um, you know, if if the sun is getting hotter, then you would expect things on Earth to get hotter. If the sun is getting cooler, then you're going to expect things on Earth to get cooler. Um, it and it does vary. There is there is a difference in the what's called the insulation. That's different from insulation, like you put in a house to keep it warm. Um, that it, it's a um, it's the amount of energy that reaches Earth per unit area in like one second. The insulation changes depending on where you are in the solar cycle. Mm-hmm. So if we're going into an extended minimum where the solar cycle is bottom out and flat line, um, then you would expect the insulation to change during that period as well. Mm-hmm. So that, that's, that's uh, un- unfortunately, a lot of the climate models, um, w- there used to be something called a solar constant. Mm-hmm. Because the solar constant was when we thought that it all stayed the same. Right. And now we know that it doesn't. And so astronomers have changed to this insulation value. Uh, but a lot of the climatic models, I think, still use, best I can understand, still use the solar constant. So they're not expecting it to change when it actually does. So I, I, would, I, would, advise, uh, I would advise the model makers to sit down and maybe have a look at that. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and put an, an end to the global warming debate too. So, <laughs> well, you know, it's it's uh, I, I that kind of gets political, and I kind of don't do I I, I I don't publicly do politics. I, I know we're joking, but they're saying too, like the sun getting hotter and hotter, and um, you know, everything else too. Just trying to um, you know, get a theory out of it. But um, we'll, we'll talk. It's about, not. It's well, not. Okay. All right. Well, we'll we'll talk about some other things as well too, including um some of the things you're doing, and also the uh co- the Cr- the Cresperian Saga series, and also Displaced Detective series. You listen to the Mike Wagner Show at the Mike Wagner Show dot com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit our line at sonicwebstudios dot com for all he needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at one eight hundred three zero three three nine six zero. That's one eight hundred three zero three three nine six zero. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios dot com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get ten percent off your first order. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the Mike Wagner Show dot com. You can check our Facebook page, Facebook dot com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, also on Radio Public and Anchor FM. Also, watch the Mike Wagner Show on YouTube on the Mike Wagner Show YouTube channel, and take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with the interstellar woman of mystery, Stephanie Osborne, author of over forty books, including the latest about the shuttle disaster. We talked about that. That, and also co-author the Cresperian Saga series and the quickly acclaimed Displaced Detective series. Let's talk about the uh, Cresperian Saga series and uh, just um, tell us all about that. Well, the Cresperian Saga series is um, uh, Travis Taylor. We mentioned him earlier. Um, he and a gentleman named Daryl Bain wrote the first book in that series. Uh, it's called Human by Choice. 
And it's about Earth's first contact with extraterrestrials when their starship wrecks in our solar system and some of their life pods make it to Earth. Um, by the time it came time to write the first book, the next book in that series, uh, Travis's wife was getting ready to have their second baby. Oh, and wow. And kind of up his eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so he, he, just, he just ran out of time to be able to do it. So the publisher tapped his protege on the shoulder, namely me. And so Mr. Bain took the lead on that book, and I stepped in to help co-author it. And so book two, The Y Factor, uh, was was written. And, um, yes, I have a cat talking in the background. <laughs> what, what's a cat saying? Hmm? What's a cat saying? Um, he's, he's fussing because... Uh, my husband just fed him, and and he he thinks that it should be more or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm kidding. I thought you might have uh, detected a cat language. That's what I was saying. So, <laughs> no, actually, actually, he um, he does pretty good with with certain English words. He can he can communicate if he so chooses. Nice. It, okay. It, 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 gets, it gets weird when he does that, though. Mm-hmm. He can say hello. Uh, uh oh, oh no, oh, or feed yes. me. No, feed me is usually just. Uh. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but he can also say "mama" and "Daryl," which is, Daryl is my husband. Okay. Uh, so he can call, he can call us if he so if he wants to. Okay. But anyway. <laughs> amazing as well too it's like you know you know having unexpected guests on the show is always a good thing i mean you know i've had i've i've had cats that just jump in on uh video cameras microphones and everything else and they tend to steal the show i don't know what it is <laughs> oh yeah well you know they they that uh, it, that's one of the rules in show business never follow kids or or animals so <laughs> that's right <laughs> but anyway. Uh, okay, right. yeah, yeah. Let's continue on with the uh, Casperian Saga series, and um, you'd like to hear more about that. You know, aside from the cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so at the end of of uh, the Y Factor, we released it, and it was like, okay, now we need to do the next book. And so, Mr. Bain was was getting on up in years. I think he was around eighty at that point in time, and he was starting to think maybe it's time I retired. So he decided to let me have the lead on the next book. So, you know, the first the first book is, is, is listed, Travis S. Taylor and Daryl Bain. The second book is listed, Daryl Bain and Stephanie Osborne. The third book is Stephanie Osborne and Daryl Bain. <laughs> oh, wow. I got a circle going round and round here. Yeah. So the third book is the Cresperian Alliance, the Cresperians being the, the aliens that, that – we encountered when they wrecked in our solar system. Um, and so there's going to be at least a fourth book, which I'm working on, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm working on it, actually probably going to work on it with my publisher, mm-hmm. uh, Lida Quillen, um, because she has the, the military background that I need for what needs to happen in that book. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's going to be called Heritage. Nice. And I'm hoping here soon we'll get it finished and get it out the door. Mm-hmm. Well, that <laughs> well that'd be great. Taking, that'd be great. Keep uh, keep us up to date with that. And I see you have won like you know numerous awards as well too. We'll get to some of the awards and uh, continue on with the uh, Despite Detective series. Listen to the Mike Wagner Show at the Mike Show dot com. Powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios dot com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1 800 303 3960. That's 1 800 303 3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the Mike Wagner Show.com. Also, check our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and also on Radio Public and Anchor FM. And take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device and subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show 
on the YouTube channel. We're here with the interstellar woman of mystery, Stephanie Osborne, who is also the um, interstellar uh, woman of um, authoring, you know, books and everything. She's done over 40 books, latest about the shuttle disaster, co-authored the uh, Crisperian Saga series, also won numerous awards for burnout and uh, quite a number. So let's talk about the Displaced Detective series, which um, has, uh, you know, been been picking up steam, basically. And um, I guess a spinoff happened, too, like Sherlock Holmes. And uh, first of all, let's talk about the uh, Displaced Detective series. Well, um, <clears throat> that's that's my that's my heavy-duty mystery series. Uh, it's been described as Sherlock Holmes meets the X-Files. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I had the idea, I read an anthology of... Um, Sherlock Holmes science fiction, and I thought, this is really cool. This is something I could write, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could use, and it, the, the anthology used Victorian-era science, mm-hmm. which there are things about uh, Victorian-era science we now know are incorrect. I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could use modern science to do this? Mm-hmm. And so I thought, well, what I need to do is I need to find a way to bring Holmes to the modern. Mm-hmm. So I did. I, I, I sat down and I did my research and I dug into something called M theory. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I, I worked with the concept of parallel universes. So I bring Sherlock Holmes from a parallel universe's alternate uh, uh, Victorian era and I dump him down into modern day Colorado Springs. Mm hmm. And because he, in his version of reality, he and Moriarty were both supposed to die at the Reichenbach Falls, he can't go back, mm-hmm. or he has to die. So he decides to stay in the modern day and, and figure out how to live there and, and be a modern man and a modern detective. And so he winds up working on everything from spy cases to cases of apparent mass spontaneous combustion, to UFO sightings and, wow. and everything. So um, it's there are. I've got six uh, six books in that series. Now the original publisher was more into science fiction, and so I I now have a new publisher for it, um, Hydro Publications, uh, Ign- their imprint Enigma House Press, uh, which is which is their mystery imprint is in the process of re-releasing those books. Mm-hmm. And then there will be more books once once the extant books are, are released. So uh, the first book in that series is called The Case of the Displaced Detective, The Arrival. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can promise you, this is not your father's Sherlock Holmes. Right. So this is I went in a slightly different direction. Uh, I did my best. To, I, I think, not everybody agrees with me, but I think that Arthur Conan Doyle would get a kick out of this series. <laughs> it, it, it sounds like it over some tea, old chap, and um, whatever else. You know, th- this thing came up as well, too, when you mentioned Sherlock Holmes meets the X-Files and um, gets stuck in a modern time as well. And um, is how much time travel is involved in this um, Sherlock Holmes series? Sounds like a lot of time travel. Well, the, really, really not so much. Um, there's, there's the the time travel involved in the first book, uh, when in in getting him to the modern day. Um, there's also in in the um, the books are the arrival at speed, the Rendlesham incident, endings and beginnings, a case of spontaneous combustion, and fear in the French Quarter. Mm-hmm. Um, Fear in the French Quarter does involve a certain amount of time overlaps. Um, so there, there is a certain amount of, of time travel there. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically what winds up happening is that in the midst of all of the, the classic New Orleans hauntings, uh, there winds up being an, an inadvertent wormhole to uh, an, another alternate reality mm-hmm. in 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 the past, New Orleans in the past meets New Orleans in the present, as it were. Wow! Uh, and so that's 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 the nature of fear in the French Quarter. Mm-hmm. That's got to be something as well, too. And um, and 
with all the physics that you have studied, science and everything else, how 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 big of a fan are you time travel, and uh, how much do you believe in time travel, and can time travel be possible today? Well, the the physics indicate that that it might be possible. the The question becomes how, uh, and by that I mean um, you you basically need materials that are so um, rare and unusual that we don't know how to even find them, let alone make them, let alone manipulate them into something that we could use to travel in time. Mm-hmm. Um, is it? Would it be a dangerous proposition? Almost certainly. There are things about time travel that we're not sure about. You know, can you really go back and change anything? If you do, do you change that timeline, or do you simply spin off a new timeline? Does it does it simply branch at that point? Things like this that we we don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, do do you really want to risk going back and screwing something up? by sticking your nose in where you shouldn't have been in the first place. Right. Um, so so there's a lot there that uh, that we simply don't know about. Um, the physics, like I said, I, so far as I can tell, I, I, I've actually put together, I go, I talk to various and sundry conventions and stuff, and I have um, established talks that I can do, PowerPoint presentations and stuff like that, so mm-hmm. that I can talk to things, and I actually was invited to speak at a Doctor Who convention some years back. Oh, really? That's one of my favorite shows, Doctor Who. Oh, my goodness, especially the beginning ones. Yes. And and so I actually put together a talk about the physics of time travel, Mm -hmm. and and here's how you might do it. Well, it could be this, or it could be that, or it could be something else, you know. So I had, I had like about four to six different possible variations on how you might be able to accomplish time travel. Mm-hmm. And and I discussed them. Uh, everything from uh, black holes to tip or cylinders to, you know, uh, Einstein-Rosen bridges, et cetera, et cetera, a.k.a. wormholes. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I, it, the trick is, is not is the is it scientifically possible? It's how do you come up with the materials to do it? Mm-hmm. And, and I and, and I think that's very important too, and that's something to consider because I've asked about time travel myself. How is it possible? And you see all those shows, you know, like with Doctor Who and Star Trek in the sense, and any show involving time travel, sliders and in you know whatever else too. So. It just made me think of it, too. And, um, you know, just one more thing about Doctor Who, since it sounds like you're a fan as well, too. It's like, how do you compare the original Doctor Who to the uh, Doctor Who today? Um, well, it's... it's the I like it all. <laughs> <laughs> I started to go off into this long... Th- no, just, just cut to the chase, Steph. I enjoy it. Period. I mean, the the earlier the earlier stuff. Um, obviously, they didn't have the special effects that we have now. Mm-hmm. They didn't have the budget for special effects that we have now. So there is that. But you know what? One of the for me one of the scariest villain slash monsters of all time is from Doctor Who. Uh huh. Every time I hear exterminate. I Exterminate. Oh, oh yeah. gosh. What what was the name of it? Daleks. The Daleks. Daleks, Daleks. that's six. Okay. Daleks creep creep me out. <laughs> <laughs> but of course the doctor wins every time too. <laughs> and and of course, you know, your books have also gotten uh you know quite a number of awards. Burnout uh, got nominated for Daryl Award, USA Book of the Year, Forward Book of the Year, and Epi War, you can just tell us about some of that. And also, you're also finalist for, for some uh, other books as well, too. Maybe just uh, hit upon some of those and uh, what a war you think is like the most important to you. Well, the most important one is the one that I actually won. I've, I've been up for a lot of awards. I've been finalist for, for quite a few. Uh, but I actually won um, uh, 
the Silver Falchion Award for actually a spinoff book from my displaced detective. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I had a um, another publisher come to me and said, Steph, I'm a huge fan of your displaced detective books. I want you to write a Sherlock Holmes book for me. And I said, okay. And so we sat and discussed it, and we decided what we were going to do was we were going to make it a prequel series. And there are more. I have more books planned. I just haven't gotten to them yet. This first book is out. Um, the The series is called Sherlock Holmes, Gentleman Aegis. Mm-hmm. It's by uh, Pro Se Publications. And um, the first book is called Sherlock Holmes and the Mummy's Curse. The concept here is that it's, it's my version of Holmes from the Displaced Detective series in his original timeline, mm-hmm. in the Victorian era, in his original universe. And so Sherlock Holmes and the Mummy's Curse is... Uh, it, he, he, he and Watson uh, have, have not long met. They... they <laughs> hello, hello, Kitty. Hello. He hears me talking and he wants to join in. Hello, uh, hello. Oh, I wish I could ask you questions, but I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, so, so Holmes and Watson are young men here. Not uh, Watson is just back from the Afghan War. Um. Holmes is. I play Holmes is a little bit younger than Watson because mm-hmm. I got I got to looking at the time frames and it's quite likely that he actually probably was a little younger than Watson because Watson had already finished his medical degree, gone into the military, gone over to Afghanistan and come back. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm playing it as Holmes is is relatively fresh out of school. Watson is relatively fresh back from from the Afghan conflict. And um, they they have gotten to become good friends. They've gotten to know each other. Um, and one of Holmes' old professors calls him up, and I figured Holmes was kind of eclectic in his in his studies. Mm-hmm. And among other things, in order to learn how to handle an old crime site, he would have studied archaeology. Mm-hmm. And so I have one of his old archaeology professors call him up and say, Holmes, would you like to bring Dr. Watson and come to our Egyptian dig with us? Uh huh. We think we've found the very first pharaoh. Hmm, okay. And, and so Holmes and Watson agree, and so it is this adventure um, in, in Egypt, you know, on, on an archaeological, Egyptology, archaeological dig to find the first pharaoh so the book is called sherlock holmes and the mummy's curse and um there's a there's a a mystery convention i'm i'm a member uh, among other things of the mystery writers of america Uh, Mm -hmm. it's a it's a mystery writers union basically um or or guild or or whatever you want to call it Uh uh-huh um and so there's a mystery convention in Nashville each year called Killer Nashville, and they put they have an award, uh, a, fair, a fairly prestigious award called the Silver Falchion Award, and Sherlock Holmes and the Mummy's Curse uh, won a Silver Falchion Award a couple years back when it came out. Nice. I'm I'm extremely enthused about that. Um, I'm I'm very very pleased. Uh, up up until that point, it was you know always a bridesmaid, never a bride kind of a thing. I, I, uh-huh. would, I, would, I would make it, you know I'd be a finalist or whatever, but I, I mean, it would never win it. And so this time it's like yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations to you. you've got quite a catalog over here, especially with um forty books as well too, including the Shell Disaster and um you, you know just a just a few more minutes here. Uh, and before we let you go, we know you're very busy and everything. Probably working on your next project while, um, you know, checking out the uh, latest in the sky here. Um, what do you consider uh, your favorite tr- project and the most challenging? Favorite project? Yes. Oh, that's like asking somebody who their fa- which one is their favorite kid. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much whichever one I'm working on at the moment. Uh-huh. So, you know. Um, my next project, let's see, I've just, I just came out with a book 
um, in another author's universe. I was invited to write in his universe. So uh, Richard Wayan has a series called the Children's Series, and I wrote book six in it. Uh, it's called Campbell, the Sigurdsson Incident. It's, it's kind of a prequel, so you can read it without knowing anything about the other series. But it's an excellent series. I read through it, and I, and I just loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that just came out. Um, I've got another book in the Division One series coming out in November called Tourist Trap. Mm-hmm. I'm working on um, book 12 of the series uh, as we speak. And I'm also getting close to being about to publish. I also do, with my background, as you might expect, I've done some popular science books. Uh-huh. Um, and so I'm getting ready to put out a new popular science book called Incoming the Chicxulub Impactor. Okay. And that's that's the one that hit off of the Yucatan Peninsula and was the reason uh, that we believe the dinosaurs went extinct. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be, you know, it's, it's it's going to be about that impact and about asteroid impacts in general and 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 what what damage they can cause and stuff like that. So wow, that is going to be amazing as well too. And uh, who do you consider your favorite writers or the writers that are most influential to you? Oh geez, um, actually, um, Doyle. Jeez, uh, let me think, Doyle. H.G. Wells, um, Jules Verne, uh, Isaac Asimov, Mm -hmm. uh, Ray Bradbury. uh, This this, uh, Travis Taylor, obviously. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, Lois McMaster Bujold. Uh huh. Uh, She's alive. Uh, I love her Vor- Vorkosa Gonzaga, mm-hmm. uh, and and so yeah, so science science fiction and mystery writers, pretty much. <laughs> that is amazing too. Who do you consider your biggest influence in your career? Oh, um, you mean in terms of writers or? or it, it can be uh, anything, writers or the space program or science or whatever. So. Who you consider your biggest influence, but mainly since we're talking into writing as well, too, we could do that, or you want to mix in, you know, with your science career or, you know, whatever, it's fine, too. So take your pick. I, 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 think, I think the biggest influence on my writing is my, my scientific career, uh, because I, I even, even, you know, I'm playing uh, Division One as, as basically for fun, but even then... Um, you know, I throw out. You know, it, it's got the classic tropes. You know, the 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 beam weapons and and force fields and all that kind of. Stuff. But I actually sit down. I don't just throw that in there because that's classic. You know, science fiction. I actually figure out how it might work. I figure out the science behind it. Um, uh, you know, force field. Well, it's it's a Higgs Higgs bosonic field. And you manipulate it, you can generate a force field, you can generate a tractor beam, you can create artificial gravity, you can create a pressor beam, you know, all by the way you manipulate the Higgs field. Mm -hmm. So I actually sit down and figure these things out. So even though it sounds like, um, you know, classic, almost, you know, 1950s era, which is kind of what I'm shooting for with that series, Uh uh, science fiction... I, I still there's there's science behind what I'm doing. That is amazing. So, yeah, it, I, and I have fun with it. So um, amazing too. And uh, what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? Um, if you want to be a writer, read and read the good stuff. Uh huh. You know the classics because you, you you read that you read a lot of that and it kind of you, it it osmoses. <laughs> <It's so laughs> And then, and then when you sit down to write, you have all of these uh, these patterns of speech in your head, and so your writing will be better for having read all of those classic novels and things like that. 
That is amazing. I actually like that. I think I'll sit down and write a book after this. And, uh, you know, just uh, one more thing here. Uh, as soon as we wrap up, we're, we're with uh, Stephanie Osborne, the interstellar woman of mystery, author of over 40 books, including the latest about the shuttle disaster. Tell everybody uh, where can they purchase a book and um, also what's your website and how do people contact you? Well, my website is stephanie-osborne.com. That's Osborne, O-S-B-O-R-N. Um, and you can contact me from that website. Um, my books are available uh, in Kindle, Nook, and Print. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get them through Amazon. You can get them through Barnes Noble. Um, and some of them are available through some, some, other, some other stores as well, Books a Million, things like that. Um, and I'm also on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on uh, Instagram. I'm on Mayway. So come by and say hi. We'll do that. We'll do. And Stephanie, just want to say you've been fantastic. I learned a lot from you and uh, look forward to having you on again soon. And uh, do us a favor. We thank you for your time. And uh, please keep us up to date. I will do that. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Listen online at themikewagnershow.com and on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And watch the interview on YouTube. Also, become a sponsor of the program and or donate today at themikewagnershow.com. Join us again tomorrow for another episode of the Mike Wagner Show.